You said you hate painting. Painting is the thing I like the least, as in the action of it. I really like having an army that I've painted. You're still painting massive armies for events. You're doing a Taylor Four Games and all that. How do you manage all of that hobby time, let alone with life, but just amongst us? <laughs> yeah. A huge motivation for me is making an army that doesn't look like anyone else's. That's brilliant. That might yeah. be the best hack we've had on that the is, show. I'm going to say this. So that's, <laughs> that's absolutely genius. So I was just contemplating on some new law um, and writing some headcanon stuff for my own army that I'm going to be doing. And I, I really need some help. And who better to ask than Arbiter Ian? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> really great to have you on the show. Really great to have you on the By show. By complete coincidence, I happen to be right here. You just, I literally, <laughs> I, I, it's like a genie literally appeared. You know, didn't give me three wishes, but like uh, helped me with the law, which is, which is great. If I was to rank that, I would probably put that as like number three of the worst intros you've done. It's, it's, quite, not, it's quite a bad one, that yeah, one. Yeah, great, They've got to be a bit cheesy as well. Come on, it's got to have a little bit of... It's on brand for you yeah that's well. fine that's, we're, we're fine then that's okay that's all good yeah. that's all good well welcome to the show hi Thank yeah yes. thanks for having me it's really good to have you on uh, and and good to have you on to talk about something potentially that maybe you've not spoken about as much but but i think it's a really interesting thing to talk about for yourself you know so before we kick into it i think a good thing is obviously for anyone who doesn't know uh, your, well, yeah. your channel um, tell us a little bit about yourself, obviously, what your channel's about, uh, and then obviously we can segue nicely into into the into painting side. Talking about painting, which yeah. is yeah, the thing I never get to do. Yeah, which I get, I get, I get YouTube disappeared if I try and talk about painting. <laughs> it's not, that's not how it works. Um, yeah, so I have a channel. I'm Ian. I have a channel called Arbiterian, um, which has been going for about three years now, which really doesn't feel as long as that, but but yeah. Um, and I always find it difficult to. Oh, describe what I guess you'd say I'm a law tuber, but it's sort of sort of law mixed with the context within the law that, yeah, yeah. The, that the law sits within. Yeah. So I do want to do an awful lot of stuff, which is just here's here's what happened in the world. Um, not like I'm a member of the world trying to over dramatize it. Very much like I'm a person you know explaining it to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then also mix in that with a bit of like why the law is like that. <laughs> what are the influences on it? why does that make Warhammer law quite a specific thing? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess that's like a vague introduction. And, th and then also like we do, we do fun other things. We do Let's Plays. We do, we do a Taylor Four Gamers every month where we're building armies. So we do all sorts of fun things on the channel, but mostly it's sort of a law channel. It's so, quite a unique spin that you do the sort of fourth wall breaking that other law channels don't do. Because yeah, a lot of them yeah. are very much based in the, it's almost like they're doing like an audio book sort of thing and you're trying to immerse yourself, whereas you're very much explaining it yeah, as yeah, a yeah, hobbyist, yeah. almost for someone who is new to the law stuff, I guess. As well, there's, yeah, a lot of it's there's a fair amount of stuff which is aimed at people that are new. I do try and make it accessible for like anyone who isn't completely familiar with everything. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, we do one of the things that's grown quite a lot is we do a book clubs. So we read a lot of the novels, and my friend Mira, who's again, I say new to the law, three years ago was new to the law. <laughs> now she's read like thirty books. That's but um, you know, gets her head around it. Um, but I think, yeah, there's a, there's a thing, we'll get into this later when we start talking about painting, but the idea of like how serious you take the law and how serious you take any of this is quite an interesting one. So I, I always try and present it as like, I'm just a person talking about this silly toy soldier game I like, <laughs> rather than I'm Space Marini and, and I'm going <laughs> to teach you the incredible... Yeah, yeah I yeah. try and not do that. <laughs> I think it's really grounded, the, like the way you approach it. I think one of the things that I've I've seen in the videos that I've watched of your, your channel, I think one of the things is the way you present it, the way you explain it, it's very much on the level so someone can grasp it and understand it. And I think the time amount, because obviously a lot, some little videos can go on for like a couple of hours and things like that. I think some of the main ones, I think that for me, are really it's super interesting, keep someone engaged and also deliver all the critical importance whether it's time periods or like even mm. war, like war gear things and stuff like that you do them like the ones i've seen around about 40 or so minutes typically yeah. so it's a really good amount of time that you can you can watch a few of them if you have got a painting session to kind of tie it to what we're going to talk about it kind of but, gives you somewhere to start as well because yeah. if you don't know where you want to quite go within something it's almost like that okay i'm going to watch this video it's 10 minutes i've learned what i want to know after the fact and then you can go and google loot and then watch three hours on that <laughs> specific one thing if yeah, you really sure. want which is you know it's great that's what and i think when i was starting to do it there was definitely that little weird gap in the i think at the time i was in lockdown i was watching loads of dungeons and dragons videos and there were a load of really nice dungeons and dragons creators doing things like here's how barbarians work in 10 minutes yeah and then you go to warhammer and you'd be like well i can i can get this brilliant video about space marines which is there for a reason, right? Like they're, they're hours long because 
the idea is someone wants something on in the background. They're an hours long slideshow without a face because yeah, yeah. people want something in the background while they're painting. Yeah, of course. Want to yeah. look up, um, you know. So, so that's why that exists, and that's fine. But there was nothing in the middle. There's nothing that in that little no, you're gap right. at the start. Where, yeah, 100%. So that right. was like a conscious effort from day one when starting the channel. Or was that just sort of where you kind of naturally found yourself? It's it's quite difficult. There's there's a thing about trying to explain it, trying to summarize things that I quite like and trying to get a point across quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. And I thought there was already quite a lot of people who go into exhaust. If you want to do exhaustive detail, you know, there are people who are going to talk for three hours about bolt guns, you know, and that's fine. Um, and so there was something nice about summarizing it. That's also, it allows you to be a bit more, I don't want to say professional. I want to say more like you can spend a bit more time on like the, color grade and the look and the things like that, which is stuff I do in my day to day life anyway, yeah. like, because you're doing 10, 15 minutes mm -hmm. and you're presenting, which means of course, then you need, you only need two thirds of the moving pictures. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so you can, you can make something that feels quite concise mm -hmm. and quite like, okay, let me explain this simply for you in a way that you'd understand if I was just chatting to you down the pub, Fe felt like a, a more interesting thing to do. Uh, and also it means that I don't get bored. I, I don't know. I have never tried to write a three hour video. I don't know how I would. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, that, that's the thing. I, Cause uh, I think it was, I think one of the ones that I watched, I think it was one of the, the, the introduction video or the explanation of the horse heresy. I think that's the one of the yeah. ones that I've, I've, I've watched, uh, all the way through. And I, cause for me, that whole period time period is like, it's, there's so much like there, obviously there's like, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to get the number wrong, but there's like 50 odd, 60 odd, 70 odd book, books from the yeah. series. So condensing that down into a video, which tells you the really important key moments during that expansive seven yeah. year period, I think that's the yeah. seven year period, the heresy. So from the moment, obviously things go the wrong way to everything at Terra, there's so many key moments in there that you, to try and you've done a great job of fitting it in with that time frame of that video. But for someone new coming into it, I think there's a really funny, I think like it's explaining the heresy and like, or explaining 40K in like, 60 seconds or something yeah, like that. Yeah, there's a few so people that, have done watch like that. like a crazy yeah. video like where it skims through stuff and yes, it's it's funny or whatever in the delivery, but th you're quite right. Unless you watch like the progressive longer videos that are out there from various people, that your video sits really nicely and just allows the person who's coming to it not knowing anything to leave with a really good framework of the yeah, core, thing. core things that, that kind of do You it timed like, the release of that Heresy content so well with the well, revival. Of, it's because we were doing yeah. a tale of four gamers on the Horus Heresy at the time. Like yeah, we were yeah. all up for playing it. So, so yeah, we started, and, and, and I was like, I was like, what shall I do this summer? I know, well, that's 20 videos easily, isn't it? Yeah. I'll do, I'll do one per <laughs> legion. That's going to do that. Um, yeah, the Heresy one's a really interesting example, partly because it like, so there's a, so, you know, if anyone hasn't seen, there's a Heresy video on the channel, which is, it's the Horus Heresy in 40 minutes, all the major things that happen. Yeah. And it starts off with like a little, this is where everyone was yeah. and how everyone felt. Yeah. And this is how, this is all the major things that happen. And there's a map with all the leads. So you can see where things are happening. And I guess one of the things I quite like about that approach to law is a, it like, sounds a bit, but it's a bit of an investigative journalism approach. Like one of the things that 40 K has done a lot is, you know, 40 K is famous. And one of the things it's fun about, that's fun about it is the idea that people have just added stuff sort of semi willy nilly for 30 years. Yep. And then occasionally some people have tried to make it make sense. The and then more yeah. people just throw more stuff in. <laughs> and so there's like a fun challenge of going, all right, I'm not going to get bogged down in the exact retelling of reading out a page of text. Mm. But if I was to try and put all these things in order and put them on a map, would it make sense? <laughs> <laughs> and then the nice thing about not being in world yeah, yeah. as a law person is you can then call out when it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Yeah, you can have, you're you, not tied I'm, to it. So. I'm not trying to make it yeah. fictionally correct yeah. in the world. Yeah, so you can go, well, it says they were here, but some, it also says they were here like two minutes later. So mm. do you yeah. find it really difficult to find all of those contradictions? Because it's so scattered. It's, it, that's the bit that's quite interesting. Um, I've read an awful lot for years and years and years, right? So I've been reading this since I was 10 years old. So what I tend to find is that the thing I want to say, I already know off the top of my head, but I don't know that I have to then go and double check the exact details. So actually the difficult thing is not knowing that, and then the night Lords were sent to Thramas to do the dark angels here and they fought there. It's then me going, Oh, I need to find out where I read that. So I can check that's actually correct. Yeah. Fact check. Yeah. <laughs> is that actually yeah. in my head? Yeah. So there's an awful lot of like using, you ever use lexicanum? Yeah. yeah. So lexicanum is really good because it's, um, it's annotated like Wikipedia, unlike all the other 40 K wikis. So mm. it's, it, it, so each statement in the text, has a little note telling you exactly where it came from. Yeah. And then you can read through and go, did I, 
Am I remembering that correctly? And if so, I've probably got that book somewhere that I yeah. can just go and check. Put it out. And, and sort of try and piece it together a bit like you're telling a, like you're trying to piece together a bit of history. Because in a, in a weird way, you sort of are. There's well, 30 I'll, years of random references and, and they might not make sense. You, you, yeah. You are absolutely bang on when you say that because I always say like, to, and this might be a nice segue into it, but I always say when it comes to painting 40K or even 30K, mm. it's very much like, science fiction scale modeling like it's yeah. like it's very much got that the depth and richness of that law and narrative att uh, attributed to the to the models and miniatures so it's what i always find it a bit of a shame that 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 sometimes isn't overlaid onto the miniatures when the painting is done because it's like it's it feels a bit soulless is, is mm -hmm. the way i'm trying to explain it like, well you could you could treat it as if it was like bolt action because there's so much law and story and mm. history that it almost might as well have happened in real life if that yeah. makes sense yeah, yeah and there's there's interesting i always find it quite interesting how people like it's interesting to talk about heresy right because heresy has this weird reputation as being a historical game you can go and look through books of how the 13th company of the ultramarines were you know and what symbols they had and you could do that perfect army mm -hmm. but um six months into the heresy that wouldn't be what any of those forces look like anymore yeah because yeah. it's a yeah, so I always find that weird thing where you're like, you could approach this very historically, but everything in the background is written yep. to say, but it didn't work like that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. no, this is technically what all the signs, symbols meant, but no one had those. Yeah, and, no, and that totally. gives you a lot of freedom and a little bit of a structure, which I think is often in in this huge world of, of Warhammer and Wargaming in general, getting that balance between it, people feeling like they know what they have to do, but being allowed a bit of freedom in it is kind of the sweet spot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whether you're talking about painting or gaming or, or anything, like people want a bit of structure, but not not to have it prescribed. Yeah, I yeah. think I think that maybe. I mean, I, I like historicals as, uh, as well, but maybe nowhere near as much as 40k or anything. But I think that you're quite right, exactly with that, because it has it is that flavouring of, of it is that science fiction element to it. Mm. It does give you that liberty to say, well, what what, what maybe that company did get lost in in, in the warp for uh, two two yeah. hundred years or whatever, and they come out and everything's changed. But they've they've kept their heraldry, but they're in forty k or all that. Like it does it, that that gives it that almost air of ambiguity that it needs to give that that ability for someone new into it or somebody who wants to create something a bit different, the opportunity to. Yeah, and I think the the sci fi setting as well means that the game sort of ends up being. Post, uh, aimed a bit more towards people who want to build their little thing, yeah. which is may, maybe, you know, I don't do a lot of historicals, but it's maybe not the case with like bolt action where mm. it's more like, I want to make someone who looks like this army then. Yeah. You know, this is like, you you want to make a huge motivation for me is making an army that doesn't look like anyone else's. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. And that's with the thing. It, yeah. That is the thing. You, you are, you want to, I always see the law and narrative as like uh, as a third of the, as a third of it, and that third of it is is optional to the user. Like mm. if you really love it, then of course you can lavish it all over the project and do it. But if if you don't, then you can just paint them like the box or paint them whatever yeah. colors you like, and they're, they're perfectly fine, you know. So, yeah. so just to pull you rewind a little bit on something you uh, said earlier there. So you said you've been reading the book since you was like ten years old. Yeah, probably. What's the yeah. sort of just to give a little bit of context for the listeners? What's your sort of intro background then? Because most people oh. hear of us starting with the painting, so I'm curious yeah. if you started with the books first. Um, I no, I I've got the classic. So I'm I'm 42. So I have the classic entry point that everyone my age age has, which is Hero Quest. Right, right, right. That's yeah. So I um I had a next door neighbor who was play really into Rogue Trader 40k, uh, and I remember him showing me, I mean, I, I would have been like nine, so I wouldn't have known how it worked. Him showing me the thing and lending me the book. And the book was amazing. Yeah. The, 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 the book was like, what the hell is this? Yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> Road trade was uh, bonkers. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was, it was a insanity. crazy book. Yeah. And, and the book made no sense either. The book yeah. was laid out really weirdly. <laughs> and it's like a classic, like an 80s war gamer book. It's yeah. like the size of a tome, yeah. which makes no sense in the way it's laid out. <laughs> And it's, it's just full of like this like 2000 AD style art that's yep. all like weird and funny and horrific. And um, I remember being like obsessed with that. And then I started buying White Dwarf socks. I was like nine, I couldn't afford any models. <laughs> so you buy White Dwarf, right? Because that was three pounds. Exactly. And, yeah. um, you know, so you buy your White Dwarfs and I'd be reading White Dwarf in the play. I remember reading White Dwarf in the playground at primary school. Wow. Okay. Right. So I must have been like 10, 10 years old. Yeah, yeah. And then when I went to secondary school, like that's when this, when second edition came out. Um, and we all started playing then yeah, and, and playing in the way you do in the nineties then, which was that you had two boxes of the cheapest monopose space Marine and, a ca and the biggest character you got for Christmas. Yeah. And everyone played with that for like five years. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the scenery was made out of like shoe boxes yeah. and like, yeah, 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 yeah. green other... sheets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, um, and so I got into it originally 
through, yeah, like an external neighbor is a few years older, introduced me to it. When I went to secondary school was about when second edition was coming out. Um, and I just kept on reading it. And you'd be reading codexes back then because there, was no, there wasn't that many novels. And then as Black Library took off, I just carried on. I just never stopped. Mm. So you end up having, you end up having versions of armies, of load of different armies and versions of load of different codexes and, and you know, white dwarfs of, you know, memories of white dwarfs from 30 years ago. And it all sort of filters into this big melting pot that you vaguely can maybe pull a video out of <laughs> somehow. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Okay. No. Well, uh, James sort of alluded to the the whole pillar thing, which is sort of the the common trope in, mm. in Warhammer space, I suppose, which is you've got your three pillars. You've got the law, the gaming, and the painting. Yeah. So obviously you're mostly known for your law stuff, but mm. I'm given to understand as well from your videos as well. I guess number two for you in, in the pecking order is, is the gaming as well? Yeah. I mean, th they're sort of... The gaming and painting is a really interesting thing. I, yeah, I play a lot. Um, and it's in, like, I'm not a particular, like I've done a lot of events. I've gone to a lot of tournaments and things like that. I enjoy playing the games, but it's part of all, I think this is the case for a lot of people specifically in Warhammer, right? The, what I want when I play a game is, is first it's socializing. Yeah. That's the main thing. Right. <laughs> and then it's like, you want to feel like you're playing a bit of a game, like a fair game. And then thirdly, it's like the achievement of doing it. Mm -hmm. It's like the look. It's, it's the ability to turn up and go, look, I've got my army and here's your army and we've got this battlefield and we've all, it's all painted and it all looks amazing. And I'm, I'm the sort of gamer that will like, after every dice roll, clear all my dice off to the side yeah, so that it doesn't ruin how it looks. The spectacle, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I, I won't, like I have modeled objectives, not objective markers, because that would ruin it. And then, you know, you want the immersion so, of your yeah. space marines. You don't want like thirty foot dice falling down from the <laughs> yeah. sky. <laughs> and you want, um, and and so like you want the. I want to play the game because it gives me the excuse to, and I want it to feel like a like a game. Mm. But it, but the main thing is that it gives me the excuse to do this big spectacular, cool looking storytelling thing. Um, you know, if I if I so I'm I'm sort of I enjoy the gaming, but I'm not really into the game. If that makes sense, okay, right. like like. If I just wanted a gaming experience where I pit my my will my my tactics against my friends, there's like a million board games that'll do that better. Yeah, the 40k is not or Harris. They're not well known as being exceptionally tight, clever games. That you know, it's a bit of a mess, right? <laughs> so, uh, so uh, if I wanted a, like a hardcore gaming experience, there are board games that do that better. There's nothing like a game of Risk. That's, yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. a game. Or even like you know the Catan's the card. There's the really beautifully elegant board games yeah, out there to make you think. But, um, but yeah, so for me, like I do a lot of gaming and I play a lot of games and therefore I paint a lot of models because for me, part of the point of playing the game is, is getting this fantastic model army out. Yeah. So no, it I all sort of folds that. into one. Yeah. They're kind of excuses to do each other. Yeah. If, yeah. You know what I mean? Like the law is an excuse to have a reason to play the game and yeah. painting is an excuse to be able to get the models on the table and they're kind of all holding each other up. Yeah, years ago I, I implemented and a few friends of ours uh, implemented a policy of we don't play with unpainted models. Okay, okay. right. That's awesome. So that's a standard. So yeah. that means you have to paint the bloody things. Yeah. Um, to get so, it. Well, that goes one of two ways, doesn't yeah. it? That either means that you end up finding all of these like ex uh, being okay with models not being perfect and yeah. just getting stuff done and being really efficient or you do what we do, which is <laughs> never stuff play. never gets finished yeah. and you never play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I, so it was interesting like the way my approach to painting is very much like, can I think of new techniques that allow me to get this army on the table faster? That's really interesting. Yeah. And like, and, th and then I think everyone plays that game right where, and I, I know people who have got caught in the trap of, I want every model to be as good as I can do, mm. which where you end up in two problems. One is you never finish an army. And the other one is the minute you do finish it, you don't like it anymore because the model at the start was, wasn't as good as you can do now. <laughs> You're like, guests are coming on our podcast and calling us out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that's the, so, so yeah, I think everyone has to play this game of like how much, uh, we, we've all got, this is your job. We've all got jobs and we've all got other things to do and we've all got, like you always have to play this game of how, much, how good do I want it to look for the effort I'm willing to put yeah. in. Yeah, to get it there. Like, can I, for me, a lot of it's like, I really enjoy techniques that are like, you can do this crazy massive thing on a semi-random large scale that ends up with an army that look really cool on the table, but don't look too close. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I yeah like, that I works. quite like stuff like that. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's good. I mean, I, th- I think that's a really good approach to it because then you're not giving yourself kind of false expectations of where you want to be. You're like, right, I just want to get it. You're, you're, mm. you're tailored. We always talk about like when it comes to approaching a project, um, uh, you know, as, as a painter, just decide on the purpose for it or what, yeah. your, what your level of, of I'm happy with that is. Um, and it can be the extreme that, that some of us do go to. And it can be, it can be never having anything ever completed or on time, <laughs> um, you know, um, uh, and then it can be obviously the other end of it where it, it does look great from a table and you're not too worried about potentially dice being hurled at it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah that's the other thing, um, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is definitely the other thing. Or someone leaning over, like I saw at Bad Moon the other week and spinning a whole pint glass on the table. But, oh. but yeah, like um, that, that does happen. Yeah. Like, yeah. I uh, suppose it depends where like the heart of the enjoyment is yeah. for it anyway, because there's, it's all about balance, I guess, isn't it? And yeah. if you're, for example, like the reason that I'm, will spend so long painting the models is because that's my excuse for everything else. Like I only want to paint the, the stuff. Like the fact that there's lore exists and that the games exist are really just an excuse for me to be able to do what I love, which is the painting. Yeah. Whereas you've got people that see it complete opposite end. I think I watched one of your videos and uh, forgive me if I'm misquoting you, but you said you hate painting. I, the, the painting is the thing I like the least, as yeah. in the action of it. I really like having an army that I've painted. Right, right. I really like, like having like, my thing I've done. They're like in conflict with each other though. That's really, yeah. that's a really interesting point. So, so when it comes to, so let's talk about your pro- process. So when you, when you decide you want to paint something, so like yeah. you mentioned, obviously doing Tale of Four Gamers yeah. for various things. Um, so when you're, when you're sort of like approaching a project, like what are the things for you that like are really important? Bearing in mind that, you know, you said you like, you hate painting. Like, what, what, are the, what are the things that are important for you that you, to get you to that point of having the, the spectacle or like, what is it that's... I, I think I usually, when I'm starting a project, so usually that there's already an end goal in mind. So I rarely nowadays do I start a project that I'm not doing it for a reason. Right, okay. Right, so that's one of the reasons we started Tele4 Gamers was to give ourselves some deadlines and be like, you need to have this done in four months, we're going to go to an event. Yeah. And so usually I've, I've got an end goal in mind and I've got like a cool idea. Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh yeah, I'm going to do white scars, but they're all ex Terran void white scars. Okay. So how would that look? And then the, then the game for me, the thing I enjoy is the bit where you go, right, well, how can I achieve that? at this scale with like the, the thing, the specific thing that I, I always, I, I find I'm not a fan of is, is, is brush painting as in like, as in I, I quite like all the weird tools and techniques. Mm -hmm. Like, I love the idea that you might like come up with a ton of weathering powders and sponges (laughs) and weird (laughs) chemicals and do it on a whole army and see what that looks like. And that's, I find loads and loads of fun. But the bit where you, you solve the problem by sitting there with the model and going, Right, so I have a head, edge highlight here, and then I'm going to do that the whole model <laughs> that 300 more times. <laughs> then I'm going to put the second layer on. That's that's the bit where I'm like, this is my least favorite part of the hobby. What is it and specifically so, about that that you don't enjoy? Is it just because it's it's boring to you, it's time consuming, or is it because you it takes a skill maybe that you don't you haven't practiced? Yeah, I mean, or? there's probably a few things. Like I'm aware that I probably could paint better, mm. but if I was doing a single model, but I very rarely do, and, th- and that's been an interesting thing recently with like getting sent models. Sometimes mm. I end up painting a thing that I. I've never done before and it's quite fun to just go, I'm just gonna do this, for, I'm gonna paint this guy for a week. Mm. Um, but often, yeah, it's I've set myself some goal of like, I'm gonna I'm gonna paint a hundred space marines by August. And the bit where I have to paint all of their all of their pouches brown is <laughs> like just, just don't stick them on. So I start so then I start getting into all these things where I'm like, I I've really started enjoying doing doing tanks, doing loads of tanks using loads of masking tape. Uh, to give them like big diagonal stripes or big V shapes on them, but which I don't have, to, which I do with them with an airbrush or a spray yeah, can. Yeah. And then you can sponge that down with sponge weathering. And it, it means that I don't get that thing where, yeah, I'm painting blue pants number 53. <laughs> I'm spending three evenings of my life painting blue pants number 53. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm no. like, is that because you prefer <laughs> the, the fact that the models are larger with the tanks or is it because it's like man-made material rather than... I think it's like, I think it's literally just boredom. I think it's the fact that that way of painting means that day one means like I'm, okay, now I'm playing with masking tape. Brilliant. I've done masking tape 20 tanks. Now I'm going to, now I'm going to do some airbrushing on day two. Oh, what are you doing the next day? Well, now I'm going to do some like oil weathering of the airbrushing well, next day. And now I'm going to pull off the masking tape and see, see what tidy up the edges. And you're doing a different thing every day, yeah, you know, I which I guess makes, I guess, I wonder if like that, breaking it down into that sort of series of very different tasks where you're doing different crafts almost mm. makes me feel like I'm progressing faster than if, if my task every day was break out the paintbrush, you're doing blue. 
or break up. Like that would make me like almost zone out into like, yeah. Oh God, this feels this feels tedious now. Wow. That fascinates yeah. me because James is from the batch painting school of I'm going to spend the next four days painting 150 brown belts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the thing is, it's like yeah. it's really interesting because like uh, different painters and different person personalities, like ex yeah. experiences of painting, is actually really interesting for me because I, I'm complete opposite. Like, yeah. I love getting in the, the the cadence of like working through and like and yeah. doing, that's, that's the way I that's the way I approach it. I, I admittedly I love throwing weathering powder at models. Don't get me wrong, like, there's nothing wrong <laughs> with that at all. I love yeah. sponge weathering. Sponge weathering is amazing, especially when you want to get armies looking really like sort of battle worn or gritty quite quickly and efficiently as well. Um, and sponges actually work really well for giving you a very natural kind of like chipping yeah. and weathering effect. Otherwise, you do have to sit there and individually dot every single bit. Which again, like you're saying about brushes, that must be something that would be. For you, but like for you and your painting completely like that could be like must be like the worst worst the, thing the ever, worst thing ever. Yeah. yeah like but, and, and there's also something i really enjoy about the risk of of like those techniques where you're like i'm going to use a load of sponge weathering i don't know what this is going to look like yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i'm but i've done it on the first model so i'm doing it on 99 more yeah <laughs> and we do not know what this army's going to look like at the end of this technique that's really and interesting. there's like a weird like oh it could go either way it's exciting and um <laughs> I could ruin the whole thing. <laughs> you, you kind of treat the painting a bit like an experiment then. Yeah. And that, that sort of trust the process, like, like RT trust the process where you do things where you're like, right, I'm going to do the following things and they will look like something at the end, <laughs> but I don't know what they're going to look like at the end until I get there. And then I've committed. So that's yeah. how it's going to be. What's been some of the projects where that's like potentially backfired yeah, the most? I've, I've got this squad of um, stormtroopers I built. That, they were painted yellow and black that I built out of um, a mix of max mini parts and spare bits. And I remember the last two days of painting them just being like, I'm never bringing these out again. They just, it just, whatever combination of like, excuse me, whatever combination of like, um, the way I decided to structure the paint job, like the paint, I painted the yellow first and then I tried to use black Templar over the top of it. And then it didn't quite, and I was like, oh no, now it's, now all the highlights look yellow. So that means I'm gonna have to paint all the highlights on which I was hoping to avoid. That's why I was doing the contra. <laughs> no. Yeah. And I learned a lot. And that mod, that whole little army of like 40 models got painted and then put in a box. <laughs> and, and yeah, there is a bit of that. Like, yeah. I suppose you rarely learn from the successes in that sense. Yeah. Too. I did. We did a war cry tale of four gamers and I picked the spider guys. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then once starting them realized that the act of painting all the little bandages was like torture. Because <laughs> they're just covered in tiny little strips of fabric everywhere. I was just like, I don't ever want to do that. This is all. Why didn't? And you go, you go into it going, the color I used when I airbrushed these should have been the bandages. As artists, we know how time consuming painting miniatures is, especially if you want to achieve a high standard for tabletop or display. Life is busy and we don't all have eight hours a day to paint. Plus, if you're still early in your painting journey, it may feel that you're a long way off ever owning your own beautiful army for your games. For 10 years, Siege Studios has been delivering bespoke miniature painting commissions to collectors and gamers all over the world. We have a world-class team of artists from Golden Demon winners to ex-studio painters, collating hundreds of years of collective experience. Here at Siege, we offer a series of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget, whether you want a favorite character for your display or a stunning gaming army. We pride ourselves on offering well above the industry standard of quality and our customer experience. To see our gallery, learn more about our services and get a quote now, head over to siegestudios.co.uk or head to the link in this episode's description. A few things that come to mind just from obviously learning what your process and like the way you approach painting and stuff. So when choosing models or that, so let's just mm. say you've done a brand new Taylor Taylor Four Gamers and yep. for argument's sake, let's just say it was Necromunda, just, yep. just pulling a game out of the, out of the air. Do you select, a, do you look through the gangs yep. and choose one based off of the law side of it or do you choose it based off of I'm not going to enjoy the painting process what's your first indicator as to what you're going to go with the first indicator is law and now I am <laughs> learning that I probably should choose whether I enjoy the painting them or not <laughs> that's very yeah. fair the, um, the first indicator is law um, there's a few things I guess there's a few things I try and look for I really like because I quite like the weathering process, yep. I've got really into using like gloss varnishes and oil washes and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I nowadays tend to go for very, very pale or bright things I can paint. Mm -hmm. So that 90% of my work is making it darker, not making it brighter. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm starting from a base of like a, the brighter color I'm airbrushing or spray panning is already the brightest thing they're going to be. Yeah. And now yeah. I'm working down rather than I'm, I'm going to try and work up from black because I know that will require me to do things that 
that'll be the things that I don't enjoy doing. Um, a lot of the time, my choice, one, one thing that I think a lot of people dislike, but I really like is I love building things. I love building models, which loads of people complain about, mm -hmm. but I really enjoy, a, weirdly, like you're saying with the brown belts and things, I really enjoy a mindless, end, endless assembly line of pointless Marines where I'm just sitting there going like, right, your leg's done, your arm's done, one there. And I can sit there for three hours in a row just assembling the same Mark VI tactical Marines. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and zone out completely in a way that I can't when I'm painting. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. interesting. I, I do 100% synergize with you on that. Like I <laughs> build in for me, as much as I, I love painting, don't get me wrong, but I, I, I think specifically tying to the thing that you, you're more well known for, which is obviously the law side of stuff, I think the building aspect of miniatures and doing armies and stuff is the bit where you actually start developing the persona and the character mm. of that army model or faction or whatever the case may be. Um, but yeah, I agree totally. Like building for me is like a really almost like Zen like state because it's like it's not the level of attention investment as as painting. Yeah, but you still get a really uh, really rewarding finished article when you've got that model and it's fully cleaned. The barrels have definitely been drilled and and all those other bits and bobs. Um, that's another topic and a whole new <laughs> whole other conversation. Um, but but like all, that part of it, the building side of it, is definitely I agree with you wholeheartedly. Like it's it's a really important part in my mind in no matter what you paint them like or however you yeah. approach the painting or whatever like the build is is it, important does that send you down the rabbit hole a little bit having that base knowledge of all of the law because well, when you're building the models do you kind of start to be like well they would never have you know yeah this so and the, this. there's a load of i i really like the um the part of the building of the army where you go i've got this idea which bits am i going to use like yeah. very rarely do i assemble anything out of the like i've always done something to it mm. yeah, yeah um and and so little things like, like, yeah, the, the Heresy White Scars army is meant to be, okay, so there's, there's this one picture in one of the old Heresy books of a fifth legion pioneer before they discovered Jagatai Khan and become the White Scars. And they were these pioneer companies and they all had different emblems and things. And one of them was called the Void Devils. And the emblem was these three little petals on a black field. And they were the Void Specialists pioneer company and they had to be brought into the White Scars. And I was like, great, that's the idea for the army. And then you go, okay, well, it's a White Scars army, but they're going to have breacher squads and heavy terminators because that would be what this Void company used to have. Mm -hmm. And then we should make, we should keep that, that little weird little illustration of that three petal design. Okay, let's make three versions of that, turn them into 3D shoulder pads, print enough for the whole army. So every guy has the White Scars symbol on one shoulder and the Void, void Devil symbol on the other shoulder in honor of this, and you, and you get into this like, well, they wouldn't use that. Well, they would use this. Well, the the veterans who are in the older armor, they would have the Volkite weapons because that's what they used to have. Mm. But then they've been away for a very long time, so they don't want to get rid of their armor. Whereas the new guys in the Mark VI have the bolt guns. And you get into all this like, and then I can build them like this to do that. And I'll sculpt this on them and put this special shoulder. And that becomes really, really interesting. And then I've got a hundred of them. I have to paint them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where the rabbit hole comes from. Yeah, no, I agree. But it's so interesting that you say that because like, I, I I always say it's like artwork for me and even like the stories and things like that. Like it just in that example conversation, you literally just said that the way you've gone from a, one single picture of art to the thought process of all those options and choices to make that unique special army for yourself. Mm. That's one of the things that I find most, the most interesting about whether it's 40K, 30K, whatever, like, you know, the, the fact that it's so easy to get lost in sort of like exploration mm. of like how you would have your army all from a singular point of origin like that that bit of art or a passage in a, te in yep. a bit of text or they like describe a certain chapter briefly in, in, a, in a novel or something and you're like oh i want to collect that you know like i've always had a burning desire to do black dragons as a chapter yeah cause, cause with, just, all bones, with all the bones sticking yeah. out of them because you don't see a lot about them like that's something that's always been and i'm not going to do it next week don't worry like, <laughs> there's a there's always been a niggle to do something with them because it, it's they're so different from any other chapter if that makes sense and also like, you don't see them around a lot no you don't so you end up with the black dragons army exactly, yeah yeah which i yeah that's what i really want i want that little it's, and i think that's like as you you had mentioned in the, in the notes before this that like what's the benefit of, of getting into the law on that side is that one of the benefits isn't the big stories. It's all the weird stuff. Like mm. one of the great things about 40 K law is people are encouraged to throw in like weird throwaway references to stuff that's never going to get followed up on. You find this a lot when new people are coming into it. Like, Oh yeah, what happened with this? And we're like, I don't know, Dan Abnett <laughs> just went, Oh, it's the space Marines were painted pink and never mentioned them again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe 20 years later, someone went, 
famously, those space marines were all killed in a chaos ambush in nine nine seven eight four two M forty one, and then you never hear from them again. And you and it's littered with stuff like that, specifically so that it gives you ideas for cool armies. Well, it creates that gap from the yeah. first time they mentioned to that passage or whatever yeah. happened to it, where you're like, well, what actually happened in that period yeah. of time? Like, who was in command? Like, what was the, what was the chapter about? What was their method of war? Like, all, the, all this mm. kind of stuff. And that's where the the beautiful like discoveries that translate to painting happen because like it kind of gives you that ability to create your own story within that headcanon wise obviously it's never going to be printed in a book mm. or anything but but it gives you the opportunity to 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 kind of like make your corner within that massive galaxy does that make mm. sense and i think that's one of the real advantages of of having that kind of hybrid of like there is this like this is a law blah 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 but at the same time you've got the ability to be that creative with it when it comes to the painting side and also they are not unknown for people just coming up with their own cool head cannon. And if it's cool enough, it might find its way into a book at some point. Yeah. Well, Peach like, is a happens. great example. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah he's, the he's, he's very nobles, literally. Yeah. It's, you know, um, so. There's some Space Marine chapters I know that were people's personal chapters at Games Workshop. And then other people were like, I know that you wanted this for them. So I'm just, next time I write that book, I'm just going to fold them in. And there's loads of things like that where it's like, yeah, you can, you can, you can make up your head. And there's that weird world of like, trying to place it so that the canon works. I quite enjoy that sort of like, I've come up with this and it is made up, like oh, the, the Void Devils chapter of the White Scars, but they're based on something that did is written in a book. So it's believably could have happened. I don't know. There's, a, there's that like fun place in the middle you're trying to hit. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Okay, well, to segue this slightly then, one of the things that I'm really fascinated about is you're someone who does all aspects of the hobby, which to me is alien enough. But then... <laughs> <laughs> On top of that, you do a YouTube channel. I know that you're somebody who has a job outside of YouTube yeah. and all the Warhammer stuff as well. How on earth do you balance all of that time and still have, you know, you're still painting massive armies for events, you're doing a table yeah, yeah. games and all that. How do you manage all of that hobby time, I mean, let alone with life, but I just mean, amongst yeah, us? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a little bit of it is my entire painting philosophy being how quickly can I get this done? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, which, you know, I, I, there is a bit of me where I'm like, it would be a really nice experiment. to. Ch I went to Golden Demon the other, the other year. I saw it a couple of times. And um, there was a bit of me looking through going, you know what? It would be a really weird and interesting experiment to try and paint good. Um, to try and like do a model as well as I could and learn some techniques. But um, no, there's no time for that. Um, so it's an interesting one. I, yeah, so I don't do YouTube full time, um, uh, which is another reason why I don't often do three hour videos. That's um, fair. Uh, I you do say that, but you still upload like fairly regularly. I do, yeah, I do. And about half the things I upload, uh, we've got into the habit now of like about half the things I upload are stuff that can be done quite quickly, like book clubs. Yeah. We read a book and then we chat like this, we chat for an hour. But then you've got to read a book. Yeah. So I barely read books as it is. I don't know how you oh, really? Yeah, yeah, no, I am. Um, so, I often, I travel a lot for work, mm -hmm. which means I'm often on a train or a plane. And um, so I write a lot of scripts when I'm away for work and when I'm traveling. And then I tend to batch record them all at once. So I'll just change shirt five times uh, <laughs> and, and sit there talking on off an auto cue into my camera. And then, as I said, like my, my it's not really what I do anymore now because I sort of run a company, but um, my background is in like editing and animating. So I can, I've got all the preset templates set up so that I can, I can basically, I can make a video in a day. Yeah. If I know what I'm, what's, what's going to be in it. So if I've got the script written, I can get from the start of an end of a video in a day. Um, and with a book club or something, I could probably edit four or five mm -hmm. because it's just a chat. So, so again, we sort of save them up. So I'll be reading books on travel or things like that. And then I'll come back and me and Mira will sit there and spend a Saturday doing four book clubs. Um, and I'll, or I'll spend the morning just recording four videos and then they'll just come out as and when, and a, a big, a big part of trying to, um, run that efficiently is, um, like, like there's all these weird little things you get into, like YouTubers have patrons and, and scheduling and, and early access and things. And you have to sort of mold all of that to fit the fact that you don't do this a full time. So, mm. so for example, I, I do a thing where it's like, if you join the patron, you will get them when I've edited them. When I've edited them, <laughs> I will upload them to YouTube and then I'll put it private and I'll give you the link on Patreon and they'll come out whenever <laughs> because then I can't promise anymore. And there might be five early ones or no early ones at any given day, Definitely. depending. Because, because you know, because you, because, you know, I've got, I might suddenly get called to go and do a, a project far away next week. And yeah. then suddenly I, so, you know, you have to sort of build everything around that. Mm. Um, 
Tale of Four Gamers was a really good way of making sure we are still actually building things. I know a few people who do this sort of thing don't have time to build and play anymore, mm -hmm. which is an issue. Um, and I think also, as I, I sort of mentioned it, but I went on the, um, I don't know what to call it, the influencer scheme, the, the thing where you get sent models and yeah. you have to yeah, post yeah. them. And it's actually very, I don't know if you guys have probably ever been on it, but, but like, you, it's very random, right? You, you're on it, you go, these are the games I like. You may or may not get sent stuff. When you get sent stuff, you should, you, you, you can post about them. You don't have to, uh, but you probably should. And what that means is that I, I've, I've got a little bit of me going, oh, I've been sent these things. I would never usually do that, but it might be quite fun this week. I feel like I should do something. So mm -hmm. this week I'm going to paint this weird Necromunda character or, or a goblin or, you know, just you get these. I like the other week, um, I did the whole Dark Tide set in a week the whole Dark Tide miniatures game set. Cause I was like, I've never painted any of these models. Mm. And it's like, a, a, it feels like a doable thing this way. It can be my project for the week in the evenings. It's just this, this evening, I'm going to paint all four characters. Tomorrow I'm going to paint all the Poxwalkers. That's mega. Yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, no, we're getting shown up because the Dark Tide set is just sat there in the box. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then there's like two other sets sat there in the box. Yeah, where yeah. I feel really guilty about, but, but it, what I'm saying is like that, it, it's all those little things that push you to get something done. Yeah, like, yeah. like, oh, you've got, a, you're doing a thing that you've built into the channel that you have to paint some models for an event. Therefore I have to do this. And, uh, and that has helped me keep up with it. But yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's really difficult. Sometimes I've got like just my work is also like right now I'm in quite a quiet period. I will be for the next few months. Then it's going to get really busy in autumn. And so I try and sort of make as much as I can when, I, when I'm quiet. Yeah, no, totally. And yeah. If you're a long-term listener of the podcast, you'll know how important it is to have the right tools to aid you in your painting. And if there's one piece of equipment that I could never live without, it's my Onyx lamp from Native Lighting. It doesn't matter what brush or paints you have if you can't see what you're doing in the first place. The Onyx is the perfect lamp for miniature painting because it's super bright, 2,200 lumen LEDs cast soft and diffused light on your models without any harsh shadows. And its daylight balanced color temperature of 6500K gives you the confidence that the colors you are painting are accurate. As someone with a very small hobby desk, by far my favorite feature though is its articulating arm, which clamps to the side of your desk, maximizing your workspace. It's also super adjustable so you can sit comfortably in the perfect painting position without sacrifice. It also folds up into a compact shape, which is great if you like to travel to paint with your friends. To upgrade your setup and order yours now, head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop or head to the link in this episode's description. Yeah, and so with, when it when it comes to sort of like those decisions, like we were saying, obviously you you've kind of like just to segue back, you said about um, like choosing the painting side as well mm. as the law side. Like uh, a really good point that you made was that about starting light. Like I think a lot of painters have have kind of like been taught or understand to start darker and build up to the brighter point, yeah. which. I think when you're trying to do things fast and when you're trying to do things at, at, to a decent standard, I think that can, can sometimes be, be not, not the best sort of like launch point because you're adding loads of progressive layers of color onto a miniature to get it to the bright point. Whereas if you flip that and you just add shadow and depth to suit on a bright object, it, it actually ends up being less time investment. And then also as well, you can dial it back a little bit if you, yeah. if you do don't want it to be so dark or whatever the case may yeah, you be. You can always make something dirtier. Yeah. 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 Is it? <laughs> yeah. I, I really enjoyed a few years back in, in another of a search for like, how can I get my, my painting armies up faster and in trying out different techniques. I started doing a lot of, as I mentioned, like, like oil filters mm -hmm. where you essentially do all the main, do all your base colors. Um, and then, and any fancy things you're going to do gloss varnish the model dip, essentially dip it in an oil white spirit mix. Mm -hmm. And then you can remove back up to bright yeah. all the bits you like, which is like another weird, fun thing to do that is different. But but it, again, then you can control how much you're re, you almost start the brightest you can, and then you go all the way down, and then the oil wash, the oil, the gloss varnish allows you to remove the washes for days afterwards. Yeah, yeah. back up so you can have if you wanted really tight control, you sort of could. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's like a and yeah, it's like a fun weird experiment with chemicals. So yeah, <laughs> you did a great video on that. We'll have it linked in the uh, description. Oh, the, yeah, the tanks one. Yeah, and the the, I, the the tank stuff with that, I was to the point where um, you could just get a bit of sponge and just wipe it off. Yeah, and because you're only and that weird thing where you if you're controlling the depth of how hard you're wiping, you can leave um, certain amounts in recess and all that like weird little tactile, crafty stuff. I quite enjoy. So does that work out? The the fact of that's your style of painting is very, very fast. I guess it's obviously 
convenient because you say you don't enjoy the painting. Yeah. But would you say that that's like equally integral to the fact of you have a lot of things you're trying to juggle? It, I mean, it, yeah, it is. Uh, also, I guess that sort of way of painting lends itself to, it really lends itself to, I've got two weeks off. Yeah. I'm going to do an army. Rather, like you would never want to do um, that method of like doing all the base colors, gloss varnishing, waiting for that to dry, oil washing, waiting for that to dry, removing it with a cosmetic stick if you're painting one model. Yeah. It would make it take way longer mm. than you know, traditionally the dry doing time. it traditionally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas when you're painting 100 models, suddenly it becomes a really efficient way of doing things because each day you're doing one task. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, having said that, I'm not, like, I'm not necessarily suggesting it produces the best painted results. Like, you know, they're, they're not, if you look closely, they're not, they're not that well painted. It's just a way of getting an army to a level where I, I am happy with it on a tabletop. But I, th- but I think that's the thing. Cause like we've said, we said, we said that it, people's approaches to painting is all very different. And for you, as you mentioned, like you want that spectacle while you're yeah. gaming, like you're not looking at it when you're gaming, you're not, you're, you're not looking at a granular level, each individual, individual model. So they're not exactly well lit either, are they? It's no. Not like when we take our photos in the <laughs> yeah, studio yeah, yeah. and everything's under like perfect lights and you've got the camera on it and everything. When you're looking at models at arm's length on a table, it's yeah. a completely different thing anyway. On top of the fact of there's scenery and other stuff going around, the immersion is a lot higher, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I think also like that thing of like, I find, I know we keep coming back to like not liking painting, but but it's specifically that bit of the the tedium for me of that, like I'm painting everyone's belt today. Like I really enjoy it when I'm doing the, what we're we doing today? Well, we're going to, dunk oil paint over everybody and see what happens. <laughs> like then I really, then it's really fun for me. Yeah. So like, yeah, there's a, there's a whole load of things in like the psychology of which bits you Do enjoy. Don't like. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. also that, like, I think maybe there's a weird thing in hobbies generally about, I guess one of the things I often come up, uh, say when any part of the hobby comes up really is like, it's a hobby, right? So it's meant to be fun. Yeah. Like you, I've got, I've got a job which requires me to take it seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that might be different if I had a different sort of job, but I have a job which requires me to, you know, take it seriously and treat it, you know, be a little bit competitive in it. And, you know, um, there are stakes. And so what I want from the hobby is something where I don't have to treat it like, like a job. Yeah. yeah. And so, which is weird being a YouTuber now, um, <laughs> but, uh, but it means that, yeah, the priority becomes like in everything, whether it's painting or playing or, or the law, it becomes like, um, how can I engage with this in a way that's still fun without taking it too, without having to take it too seriously? Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. That's so massively important. I mean, we've spoken about that a bunch of times on the podcast, but I'm very glad that you said that because I think people kind of have this notion that because other people do the hobby a certain way, that's the correct way or the way that they have to enjoy it too. Whereas I often said like if you're someone who just really really enjoys building models and you really really hate painting them and the thought of them is like gut-wrenching like oh god i don't want to paint these models like there's nothing wrong with not painting them at all and if a lot of people play with unpainted models which i know is a bit of a controversial topic to an extent but like there's plenty of people as i'm sure you know as well like that just read the books and just do the law stuff and never want to paint any models so it's it is important that you do things not only do the parts of the hobby that you enjoy the most, but do them in a way that you find fun and engaging. So for example, James loves doing the batch painting in the methodical way of doing it. You wouldn't want someone to look at that and go, well, that's the correct way. Oh, why don't I enjoy doing that too? But it's just a very personal thing, isn't it? Yeah, right. Yeah, it's got to be, it's got to fit the way that you enjoy doing stuff like that. You know, there, there are certain things that I do, like you like you, you said, there's certain things that maybe I approach differently, but our end feeling for the way that we're doing it is exactly the same if that makes sense so like i I synergize massively with you on the building as i've said like it's just something for me that i think is really integral personally um but then you're quite right there's people that look at a sprue and the fact you've got to clip it all off and then take the mold lines off and then do this and they're they're like i hate doing this i just want to get paint on it you know so like it's really really interesting and all of those are like i think there's a really interesting thing about like the sense of achievement you get in a hobby that you need you need a little bit of something you have to do yeah, but not too much of it. Otherwise, it's a chore and it's a job. This is work. Yeah, yeah. it's got to be a reward a at the end. Of it, yeah, and you kind of feel more fulfilled because you had to go through that tiny little bit yeah. of like pain, yeah. which for is the what reward. painting is for me. <laughs> <laughs> like, like having the army is the bit where I'm like, brilliant. Look, I did it. Yeah, like because I had to go through that bit. There was probably a bit in there where I did have to sit down and paint everyone's pants, and 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 I did. I had to get through that, yeah. and now I've done it. And that feels like that little bit of achievement that you need. 
but but it's it's there's a fine line of balancing like the 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 choriness and the fun of it and the bits you just enjoy and the bits and you have to you have to get the right figure out what the right balance is for you in order to get anything from it yeah but it's obviously worth the reward to you because if you yeah. if you did all of that bit that you hate the painting yeah. and then you got to the end and you was like eh then you wouldn't yeah. have done another no, no, no. army. So it's obviously yeah, yeah, worth yeah. it to you because you wouldn't have done so many projects. You wouldn't do another you, one. Would you, you get to the game store and then you're playing this big, big thing. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. Like, yeah, there's uh, finding out that line at which you're, which bits you enjoy and which bits you don't is interesting. Um, having said that, there are definitely things that like, there are definitely things I see people doing like tech painting techniques where I'm like, I would like to one day try that. I just don't have time right now. And you, you, you know, we all fall into routines, right? So now yeah. I do it like that because that's how I do everything. But but yeah, there are bits where I'm like, oh yeah, may, maybe I could play with water effects or, you know, try and learn object source lighting or something. And I'm like, I'm like yeah, I could, but, I, but the problem is right now I'm painting 40 models. So yeah. yeah, yeah, you never kind of get around to it. I guess in like a hypothetical world then where you had like just infinite time, yeah, would you like to spend, so you say you love building the models and doing the yeah. kit bashing and all that stuff. In an ideal world, would you like to spend as much time on the painting or- as, as or as much as you even spend like reading the books and so on or yeah. is the balance kind of where you like it now um i feel like at the moment i'm at a point where all the cool techniques i enjoy using i've now been using for five or six years and i feel like now i should probably learn some different ones mm -hmm. and i'm um, one of the things that always really intrigues me and so i feel at the moment like if i had the time i'd quite like to learn some different ways of doing things mm -hmm. One of the things that I've really enjoyed seeing over the last few years online is people doing like really radically different ways of coming at painting. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, obviously the way, in, you know, the really bright way in which like coming from how Citadel used to do their guides and everyone's developed is there's a certain way of painting 40K that can often be quite like cartoony and bold. Mm -hmm. um, and when I started doing all the weathering stuff, I was, it was quite interesting to me to be like, oh, this is how people who are painting World War II do it. No, no one's putting an edge highlight on a tiger. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> that would be wrong. That, they, they're, they're, they're making it as battered as possible. And then sometimes you see these brilliant things you see now where people are like, I painted all these vampires and they're only black and white. They're only dry brush black and white with a bit of red. Yeah. And, and or they're only lit from this crystal on the floor. And that's it. And it's almost like, it, it was like, I'm going to try this one technique and see if I can spread it to the whole model and I'm not going to do 50 other techniques on it. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to try that. And I re a friend of mine started doing a load of really horrific um, uh, Depths of Titanica stuff. Um, and I think they're just all painted, they're all painted with washes. There's just nothing on it except washes and they're very like, it's like almost expressionist where the paint's put. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, that's sort of where the flesh is. Yeah. Blech. Yeah, no, and I it get mixes that. in with that bit of green, and it, uh, the, and and it's covered in like skulls and bits of organic material, and and yeah, there's something I really enjoyed seeing some of the um, turnip twenty eight stuff. I've seen some of that, yeah, where people have got like bits of wire brush stuck to the model that just makes them look like a covered in, and then like I, I'm really enjoying it at the moment. I'd love to get a chance to do that sort of this whole army are just painted with two colors, or that whole army are just painted with this one technique, and see what it does. I'm quite in, quite enjoying that. It's really interesting how. From when I started, people were very much painting like the box art yeah. or like like the guides and all that kind of stuff. And I'd probably say in the last sort of like five five years or so, um, we've seen a lot of things from historical modeling, scale modeling, more impressionist kind of stuff. Mm. Like we've seen loads of these things kind of like make their way into or that have, that have been perfectly normal in like other types of, of miniature painting, yeah. be it like diorama painting, like historicals, like for scale models even aviation kits and things like that, like come into, come into 40 K and it's really good to see the, the breadth of like stylistic execution yeah. that it now has. It's I, happening at all skill levels as well. Yeah, you're, even yeah. seeing, you're seeing it not only at the hobbyist, you know, gamer level because it's quick and fast, but even on the display level painting like golden demon competitions, there's yeah. such a variety of style now mm -hmm. that, yeah, you would, you would almost think that some of those things start to creep in because they're, Oh, really, really efficient. But then you've got people doing it at a very, very high skill level as well. There's, yeah, a, there's a great one from a uh, guy who does a lot of the Golden Demon things. Uh, I think his, his Instagram handle is like uh, Baharoth, the Cry of Old Paint. I haven't seen Who that, does these incredible dioramas with just like a billion bits. He did a great like space marine being armored in this oh, like cathedral that. worth of parts. And, 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 and the painting of it is like, it's beautiful, but it's like, all in shadow, monotone, apart from the space marine in the middle. 
Yeah. yeah. And you're like, this is, it's such a statement. Yeah. And I remember seeing things at Golden Demon and going, oh, that's what I really, that's what I want from a, like, that's what I want to see. I want to see these things that are like brilliant ideas. Mm-hmm. And I, for me, that's almost more uh, like, but partly because I don't understand, there is there's stuff that's very technically well painted, but as someone who is not a very good technical technical painter, I don't understand why it's good. Yeah. No, Do you I know what that. I mean? Like no, I'm like I've never tried non-metallic metal, so I have no idea if that's good or bad. <laughs> How hard is that? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, it's like whereas, going to like an art gallery, though, isn't it? Because yeah, you yeah. see you see this stuff, and everyone's like, "Oh, this is amazing! It's incredible!" The way that, that you know the texture of the brush strokes, and you sit there and you're looking like, uh, "I don't I, get it." I don't get it because I've never tried to do it. Yeah, I'll, I'll never forget. I went to the Tate a Tate Modern recently, and there's obviously there's lots of different work in the Tate mm. Modern, and um, in one of the areas of it, there's loads of expressionist forms of art, mm. which is always interesting in itself, like someone blowing a shed up or like. Yeah, yeah. And I'll never forget it was sectioned off, and there was just like a pile of sand, yeah. and I was like. I understand there's a reason, meaning, and thought process behind it, but I just genuinely, I have the exact same thing that you were saying about NMM or like all those other yeah, things. I was just like, th- th- there's p- clearly been a lot of thought that's gone into it, the yeah. way it's positioned, the, the, the size of the grain, the angle on it, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And there's a reason why it's done and the, sh- the, the shadow that it casts because there was a light next to it and all this kind of stuff. But I was like, it just looks like a pile of sand. <laughs> but but <laughs> p- part of the reason might have been to have you to make you have that exactly, yeah, process. exactly, yeah. That's yeah. Exactly. That doesn't seem to bleed over, really, does it? Because you see, you see people doing like looser interpretations on miniatures. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the instant sort of thought process is like, oh, it's not finished, or it's been done poorly, yeah. or it's been, because it's been done. You know, it's a quick way of doing it. It's like discredited. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. you see this with um, this is slightly less related, but like you see it with like the dry brush painting, for example, mm-hmm. there's people that like to paint models like using just dry brushing. Yeah. And I think because that comes from an origin of easy, accessible, fast, people go, you can't do that at a high skill level. Yeah. And then even when it is done at a very high skill level, people are almost trying to discredit it as like, well, it's not as good. I think there's always a thing in a lot of hobbies where if you come up with a different technique, because the dry brushing is really interesting, right? Because um, that sort of, I associate with Byron, uh, mm. Art Sopus and all that sort of thing, where he's come out with those brushes and that way of doing things and popularized it. And of course, dry brushing's always been there. It's just, we used to think of it as, oh, you just use it for your metal to do it quickly. Yeah. yeah. And now it's like, no, you can actually do a, get a really Which nice can. effect if you, uh, and of course, every time that happens, someone who spent years learning the other way will feel like their way of it is being devalued. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you'll get that in everything. Yeah. Um, We've seen that with lots of techniques. I mean, you could even argue that contrast paints are yeah, just a, I was say, they're just a saturated wash, really, yeah. aren't they? There's, um, and there's plenty of people, I know for a fact, there's plenty of people that before contrast paints were doing that the very style. same thing yeah. of spraying a model with a very, very light color and then getting either a wash paint or an ink diluted yeah. with, uh, it's similarly, what you say with the oil washes and people doing the gloss varnish and stuff. People have been doing that for years. Mm-hmm. I, I have armies that I've painted with what we what was then called candy colors, mm-hmm. which now we probably call slap chop. Yeah. yeah. Right, but it's the same idea, right? You paint it black through white in zenithal highlights or, or dry brushing. And I, I remember it being, when I remember, that's like maybe 10 years ago, I remember it being, the, the theme was, you'd spray it black, you'd zenithal highlight it at various angles up to white with an airbrush. Mm-hmm. And then you'd use this candy color, which is just a contrast paint now. Yeah. To... To, to tint it the color you want, which means all your shading's done. Yeah, yeah. And looks natural and yep. the highlights and shades look correct. And and yeah, it's just, these things get recontextualized and reused and people complain that they're not, and you're like, you're going, well, a con- that way of painting with contrast colors is as old as the, you know, they're all as old as the hills. It's just people are starting to bring them into, mm. and I, I do find that very interesting when people are like, we're going to do this, piece like we're approaching we're doing a miniature art piece like a like a gallery art piece mm-hmm. you're going well, okay well this is interesting now someone someone's doing warhammer but they're doing <laughs> something to make you think yeah and yeah, yeah I, I find all that really really interesting space marine in the pile of sand that's the next gd winner <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so one thing i was going to ask um directly obviously following on that so you obviously painted various armies and stuff do you when you paint the next army yeah ever go to yourself I want to paint it slightly better than the one before. Is there ever, th- or, is, or are you more focused on the actual, the spectacle and getting it done? And uh, or, or do you actually, do you go, do you know what? I've done that, that oil wash on these ones, or I've done that, that sponge weathering on these ones. Do you ever, ever think to yourself, like, I want to refine that or want to improve, improve Yeah. That? Even by accident, you've got to eventually get better. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Just right. repetition. Yeah. 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 Accident yeah. Get better. No, I do. I do. Not, I think there's definitely a choice nowadays when I know how long I've got. Right. Okay. Whether you go, whether you go into it going, I'm going to try and learn something, yeah. or I'm going to just get it done. 
there's definitely a choice there. And I've I've found one of the things I took up a couple of years ago is Underworlds, mm-hmm. um, which I found really helpful for being exactly the right size to usually when I'm painting an Underworlds gang, it's because I want to get it done for the, a game later that week, but it's still the right size that you can try something new. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and try it, not just try it on one thing, but try it on like four or five models. So you feel like you're, it, it, for me, it tickles that exact balance between I can try something a bit different and push the envelope a bit. I don't feel like I'm losing time because I'm not just doing what I know. Mm-hmm. But it, I feel like I'm still working towards a goal, yeah, which yeah. is playing this game on the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Joe, you met downstairs. He, um, he's super into, into Underworlds. So and I think one of the things that's really good about those is that, especially for painting, is that you have all manner of different types of model within those, yeah. those I don't know, they're gang war bands. Or war whatever. bands, yeah. yeah. They're beautiful models yeah. as well. They're amazing. Like the variants of like, of like material or pose or even creature. I think still think the monkey with the knife in the tail or the crab yeah. are, like, <laughs> like the, are like the best ones. But like, but. Is that the one, the range of the crab? Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 yeah there's so, loads of criticism. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they're amazing. Yeah. It's really I good. guess it's cool though because. It's a small project, yeah. So you can do lots of different ones, but equally, even within them, they're all quite different from each other. So they can be, yeah. And you can pick. Like there are war bands where it's like three stormcast, and there are war bands where it's like an ogre, a monkey, a parrot, and a, a, you know, a <laughs> goblin. You know, okay, fine. And um, uh, so that's quite fun. But I think, yeah, for me, that that little impetus of also like you're going to be able to use it at the end. Mm-hmm. Like this, this, this little project on its own is a game you can play. Mm at the end of the week, which, which I maybe, and maybe again, getting sent models occasionally means I have that impetus to do it for a single model that I'd never have that impetus to do, but with a single model otherwise, because there's very few games you play with one model. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I, for me, yeah, it's, it's an interesting balance, right? As like getting to use it feels like it's the goal for me or getting to have built it, having that feeling of like, I've done it, I've got it is like the goal. And so I end up going, well, what, how can I get there? When's the deadline? And, how, and that's how I get everything done from the law all the way through. But I realized that that means that I never get to then, there's a limited bit opportunities to improve in that. <laughs> <laughs> so you've spoken about a lot of the projects that you've done and we've spoken about, I guess James said, about trying to improve with each one. What are the sort of, maybe your hobby goals in the sort of short or lo- even long term for for your projects, some things that you'd like to improve, kind of more specifically. Yeah, I need to. Um, I'd really like to start. I mentioned a friend who's been painting entirely with like oil colors and getting some very very like soft pastely sort of. And I'm really last year at UK Games Expo, I picked up a start off a Moonstone, mm-hmm. and it's Moonstone's one of those things where I've been putting it off because the models are lovely and you only have to paint three. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's a little bit like. That's, I, I want to look, that's one of those projects that's in my mind as that's when I'm going to learn some new stuff. Mm. I'd really like to get some really delicate, soft, like almost like I'm going to put loads of water on these and loads of color and just see what happens yeah, and, yeah. and really try and learn some new stuff. But, but I'd love to, and we've got a gap. I think we've got a gap in Taylor Four Gamers coming up in the next few months where we're not active. We're going to do like a little personal project thing where we're not trying to build an army. <laughs> And it, well, I'm I'm kind of looking forward to um, trying to figure out a new way of doing those. I, th- there's just something that, as I said, like seeing Golden Demon, seeing a few of those different ways of doing things. I mean, we were talking about potentially doing a class or something yeah. like that. Um, there's like a little thing where I'm like, oh, I wonder if it would be interesting to paint in that way. Also, I think um, I'm at the point where I've got a lot of armies, <laughs> so I don't need to paint another giant army it's right space now. Space <laughs> premium, yeah. yeah. When you, when you, when you, when you really <laughs> need to paint another bunch of space marines right Bookshelves, armies, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the loft, so the yeah, garage. Like, like, oh yeah, this might, I, I, I'm really looking forward to painting those Moonstone models. Yeah. I really like the idea of just doing a really, really nice, weird looking like goblin riding a pig. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's fair. It's a cool yeah. model. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you you mentioned obviously about like improving stuff. Yeah, we have spoken about it. Like we we we've, we've been talking about it with some form of class or something, and that's something mm-hmm. I think that could very much help you with that. So that that'd be really cool, and it'd be great to 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 put loads of people under different sort of painting circumstances. Mm. I think that'd be quite interesting. So so yeah, but um, but yeah, no, we'll we'll see obviously what happens with that. It's one of the interesting things from the Tale of Four Gamers thing is that um that we do is just four friends who build armies over six months. As you think, what's interesting is how differently we all do it. And the running joke is that I'll be spending three months building and then one month having it all painted. Whereas yeah. everyone else is trying to do it. Other people will be trying to do as well as they can on this unit this month. Mm. And then as well as they can on that unit that month. Yeah. And all the different weird techniques in between those two extremes, yeah. you end up, yeah. 
yeah it is interesting the way people approach things in that way yeah the variance is massive which is which is always always interesting um but the ultimate thing is like we said it's having that goal and and how you get there is it's so subjective it's yeah yeah and like we said earlier on the on the episode like the the relevance is the way that you enjoy doing it the most like if me and james were to paint even a display level army we'd probably approach it in very very different ways Mm, but james enjoys the way that he does it and i enjoy the way that i do it Yeah, yeah 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 We frequently hear from you with questions asking how you can paint like our team of world-class and award-winning artists. Teaching is something that all of the team here at Siege are very passionate about, and we want to share with you the methods and techniques that we use to paint every single day, all of the incredible miniatures and armies that you have seen from us. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a growing catalogue of over 300 step-by-step tutorials covering a huge variety of colour schemes, miniatures, painting styles, and techniques from beginner-focused foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses. Each lesson comes in a beautifully designed and easy-to-follow PDF format with accompanying artist commentary with new tutorials added every single week. Your subscription also includes access to our private patron channels on Discord so that you can interact directly with our artists asking for questions or feedback. You'll also be supporting the podcast directly, helping us to bring you these episodes every single week. So if you want to take your painting to the next level and make the most of your very valuable hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash siege studios question of the week time thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week if you have a question that you'd like us to answer on a future episode of the podcast please leave it in the comments down below on youtube we have a question this week from kimmy miniatures who says what would be your biggest motivation to paint and his example is a clean tidy and ready desk Mm. that is a good one well i like operating in a in a in a lucid lucid pattern of of starting very clean and through the creation process the desk becomes a bit of a battleground That's a ge- <laughs> battleground is a very generous term i've seen your hobby desk james it's yeah, it, it, it's it, what i would call a nightmare <laughs> it starts really well gets quite bad and then once the project's finished i love the cleanup the cleanup for me yeah. is like the wiping of the slate it's like that project's done i've had my creative expressionism not on the miniature because i try and be fairly regimented with that but then the desk is like paint paint pots here there <laughs> so yeah a desk is a re- desk is a really good way of doing it um but um but for me i think it's just uh, the whole the, for me the thing that i really like the most is is literally having an idea of a project uh envisaging it seeing it all the way through to the end then having that that 3d physical thing that you've, you've mm. manifested from the idea i think that for me is the is the is is the thing for me that i really sort of like gets me going and really i enjoy me so so yeah what about you i I wonder if like um for a lot of people like having being able to do that once then makes it easier i wonder if a lot of people find it quite difficult the first time Mm -hmm. to imagine that feeling yeah and then once you've gone oh i did get to the end and i did make it and i have got the thing i can totally do this again yeah yeah. it becomes a lot easier um yeah similar similar i'm i have a very small space that i do all the filming and storing all the models in and painting and so the act of going i've done that and i have now cleared it away is is quite a nice point mm. um the motivate in, in terms of simple motivation the motivation is uh, a deadline that i <laughs> long ago figured out but just giving myself a event usually that i have to have something done for whether it's like a tournament or a gaming weekend or something that's that will get me to do it even if and, and however much time it is how well i do it but <laughs> but it will get it done um yeah and it's then and sometimes that's a case of I've definitely gone, I want to go to that. I don't have an army. What's the quickest army? Yeah. Mm. Like that, and, and then I'll paint something I wouldn't usually do. So for me, yeah, motivation is, is almost entirely giving myself some horrific deadline to match. Yeah. I, do you find that once you've accomplished that, you've got this like new sense of motivation to start something else? Or are you someone who likes to take a bit of a, bit of a cool down period after? Uh, um, as soon as I've accomplished it, I'll immediately want to do something else. And then just after that, it'll drop. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's almost like, uh, like going, going to like Golden Demon or going to like a competition or whatever, seeing all the amazing miniatures. Oh, James you know, comes back yeah, ravenous and I'm like, every I'm time. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then it's like day two. It's like, oh, just, yeah, I've got all these other things. Every single time, time yeah. every single time James goes to a painting competition, he'll come back and be like, I'm so fired up. I've got all these ideas, all these ideas. I'm like, yeah, that's great, James. And I just know that next week. Day two. Yeah. Day two. Yeah. It's like, it's, yeah. I, I completely synergize with you on the, on, the, on the deadline as well. Like, um, I mean, a past former self that's now gone through a healing process uh, for, of never wanting to do this ever again. Used to be painting like before competitions in the hotel room yeah. the night before, the morning of, and all this kind of stuff. And and yeah, like um, it does motivate you. Um, 
it's a hell of a lot more stressful. I'll give you, yeah, <laughs> I'll give you that. That's like, true. You know, um, but yeah, I, 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 um, I, I completely agree. A deadline is, is great. Um, so, I yeah. think self-imposing them is potentially like, I mean, it's obviously more difficult to adhere to if you just come up with this like arbitrary Rang, yeah. date in your head. But the idea of like, I want to try and get it done for a certain day. If you're, if you're somebody who's not like looking to play a game or maybe have a small hobby circle, I still mm. think it's quite beneficial. Um, I mean, most of my painting comes from doing commissions for, for Siege over the years. And I've got that similar sense of like the deadline that I'm going for. Yeah, because you've actually got a deadline. Yeah, because yeah. I've actually got a deadline. And there are there are stakes, <laughs> financial might, stakes as it, well. It might not be for you, but the other person at the other end is going to an event. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But, um, I do think that's a good one. I think I don't really resonate with the desk thing so much because I'm someone who likes to be very, very clean Clinical. while I work. George is like a surgeon when he works. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's get a paintbrush. Like, no, it's yeah. it, like, <laughs> and there's a place yeah. for everything in mind. Then it will all just merge onto the desk through the painting project that, and then it will all go back into its place. Yeah. yeah. And then I'll be taking the same paints back onto the desk immediately <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Our closing tradition on the podcast is a segment that we call Hobby Hacks. This is where we share a little quick tip or a hobby hack with you that hopefully if you are painting while you're listening to this podcast, you can implement a... Uh, into the models that you're working on currently. And um, hopefully we have one from our guest this week, Ian. I have a hobby hack, yeah. yeah. My hobby hack, um, you know you know the, the product named Green Stuff, Nidatite, right? Yeah. Often used for sculpting things and filling gaps. Actually, absurdly useful in the building process if you're building anything that isn't plastic. So the minute you have a, if you, the minute you have a um, mixed plastic resin model or you're putting resin arms or something or metal or anything like that, I always, roll a tiny ball of green stuff, and then use like a pinhead amount in every single joint. So every time an arm goes on, every time that something touches something else, there's like, you don't want enough to cover the whole surface area of the joint, but you want enough to cover about a third or a quarter of it that um, will then need it. Um, green stuff goes an awful lot harder when mixed with super glue. So if you're doing anything that involves super glue, you put a tiny little bit of green stuff in it, it'll go rock hard, it'll fill any of the little gaps in between the rough surfaces of the two sides of what you're joining, and you don't have to hold it in place. Really? Which, yeah, because if you're attacking an, attaching an arm to a space marine and you just put a pinhead of green stuff in the joint, and push the arm on, the arm stays where it is. It's like an activator in a sense because it's got the, because it's, that tacky material, it's like holding itself it'll up. It'll just hold the arm in place. It'll, it'll happily hold a plastic part or a resin part without you needing to suspect, hold it like that. And often with super glue, you trying to hold it, you're always wobbling a little bit. Yeah, And yeah. that's what's making the bond crap. Yeah. Because because you're you're shaking while it's yeah. curing. So it's never going to completely cure all the different bits Areas that are touching. Um, so yeah, tiny bit of tiny bit of green stuff in every joint when you're assembling like a mixed resin plastic model with super glue will make the joint much hard, much stronger and mean your building is much faster. That's brilliant. That might yeah. be the best hack we've had on the show. I'm going to say, say this. Say this. I mean, <laughs> doesn't work with plastic. Plastic glue and green stuff just goes really slippery. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. because it's, it's chemically bonding yeah. and melting the, yeah. the plastic. Yeah, that, I, I've got to say this. I, I've been, from from early second edition. I've worked with metal models and plastic yeah. and joined plastics and models. And we've all been there where the arms fall off easily off the metal models. I have never had anyone in nearly. I'm I'm 38 this year, so probably in about <laughs> 30 odd years of, of miniature painting and gaming. I've never had heard that at all whatsoever. We're supposed to be the pros. I know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Ian rocks up and he drops drops the mic, mic drop a hobby S hacks. Speed like, up your Forge World building yeah, overnight, I, that will. I was gonna say that's <laughs> that's absolutely genius. I never ever would have thought of that at all whatsoever. But like I'm I'm definitely, definitely gonna have to give that a go. And if it speeds up building as much as I love building. Especially and, what you said about how it holds itself in place and because you're not shaking and it, it makes perfect yeah, sense. Makes, it makes complete sense. Yeah. Yeah. Absolute yeah. sense. How did you like yeah. so how did you come on to that? Like, no what? idea. I, 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 <laughs> I, I think, you know what? I think there was a point where I was building space marines and I was trying to, I was, I was trying to, you know, I think I was trying to build second edition metal space marines, terminators, but make them look a bit bulkier so they look better on 40 more bases. And I was trying to space the arms out a bit with green stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you realize suddenly you're like, Oh, Oh, I don't need to hold. Oh. And it, it yeah. it's actually quite a solid join. And yeah, I didn't know that the green stuff hardened with the super glue either. It'll, it'll, that green stuff mixed with super glue becomes harder than green stuff on its own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't know. Not, it's, I don't yeah. know if it's a chemical. It might just be because it mi the, the yeah, super sure. glue goes hard. Yeah, and so yeah. it into it probably yeah. to a degree as well, doesn't it? But um, but it's it doesn't have that like um, if you do green scruff sculpting of like cloaks and things, you'll find they're always springy a little bit. Yeah, yeah. it the super glue will stop that. Brilliant. That's crazy. I've never ever. 
never ever knew that so that is going to be firmly in, implemented <laughs> so I, I, look forward to giving that a go forever thank Ian for that one because that's <laughs> absolutely brilliant okay well thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective where can all of the listeners find your channel oh yeah um, R by Tour Ian at everything basically <laughs> <laughs> mostly YouTube okay Instagram for all the things I actually paint um, and uh, Twitter when I'm feeling bored okay <laughs> Amazing. We'll have all of those linked in the description of this episode. Thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. Also check in the links of the description is the links to our Patreon. If you want to support the show over there, you can do so. And we have access to all of the tutorials and amazing benefits over there as well. Thank you everyone. We'll catch you next week. Bye.